could hear you. coming in through here. Well, no, but you're really small on my screen, and now you're gone. It was the whole screen before we monkeyed with YouTube, and now you're like one little tiny piece of screen. Is that okay? Okay. It, would it be exit minimized video? I got it. You're really big. What? Well, you were. You were really big. But now you're really small. Okay. Okay. You 
I thought of something last night I wanted to hear that I haven't heard. It's new. I can't remember what it was. Well, I
Okay. <laughs> Good morning. I'm doing well, thank you. I have my good days and bad days, but overall, I live in a safe place. I'm in a beautiful neighborhood. My neighbors are all sheltering in like myself, so um, I see them. Um, so um, I reach out in my own way. I'm, I'm able to go to church. So I go to church on Sunday. Um, uh, not all churches are open in our diocese, but my parish up here is open. So um, that's a good thing. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. You look well also. <laughs> Hi, Allison. Yes. Hello. Hello. Nice um, to see you. Good morning. We're in the we're in the middle of a hurricane, believe it or not. Oh. Suddenly the sun has come out, the wind has subsided, and it is the eye. and it's fall again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's a bit of a that's a bit of a nautical term, but yes, that's what we did. <laughs> Um, Dave, I probably won't be able to stay. I, that was somebody called me saying they're going to deliver a mattress here in 10 minutes. So <laughs> <laughs> That'll be interesting. It'll be quick. <laughs> Can we watch? How much feedback do I get? Um, none. Okay, that's good. So, uh, Laurel? Hi. Okay, so YouTube is 45 seconds 
Oh, that's working? Okay. Good. You, you can hear me? <laughs> well, thank you for calling. I, we would not have known. Okay. Thanks. All right. Bye. <laughs> uh, technology. Can you all hear me on, um, on Zoom? Yes. Good. Do I sound yes. echoey or does it sound the same? No. A little feedback. A little feedback. I can, I, okay. I can hear you fine. Huh. Yeah, it's pretty clear. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Um, I'm going to try moving this just a little bit this way. That should help. Okay. Uh, and then um, for those that are on YouTube, you can see my screen. And uh, there are four people on YouTube right now watching. So uh, welcome. Wow. Good to see all of you. And. Uh, there is a live chat feature on YouTube, um, but uh, I won't be checking it much because I will be doing everything else. So I just typed in good morning to everybody there. So, wonderful. Um, I think we're all here. I think all's here that will be here. So, uh, I'm going to suggest we open in prayer. So, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for gathering us in this uh, virtual way, uh, and we know that you are as present to us as our next breath. We ask that you guide us and help us to learn more about you and about each other and how Benedict is giving us a rule to follow you in our ordinary and in our daily life. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Um, so while I was praying, I had one idea of clearing up the sound. But if Zoom is okay, then we'll continue. So can you guys hear okay? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. Good. Good, good, good. Uh, so this is being recorded on, um, on our YouTube channel. And uh, so whatever you all are saying is going out um, over the, the airwaves, just so you all know. Um, you can identify yourself. You don't have to. Um, you can give yourself a different name. <laughs> and so, if you've ever wanted to call yourself something different, uh, yeah, then uh, now's the time. But um, So, I want to jump into our class for today. And so, uh, the first step is for us to look at the book that we'll be covering. And we're covering the introduction. You should all have on your screen, the, uh, you should all have a share of that. And what I'm going to do is move a couple things on my screen to make it easier for me to talk to you about it. There we go. Good. Okay. So uh, this is the, um, the book is called uh, St. Benedict's Toolbox. And uh, we are starting today with the introduction. And Jane uh, Tomain is our author. And so uh, what she writes is, uh, is all followed in here. So if you happen to have the book, now is a good time to open it. We'll start on page one. If you have the handout, uh, then you can do that. My handout looks like this, and I've made notes in it. Uh, my book looks like this. I've made notes in it as well, but I've made bigger notes, of course, in my handout. Um, what is helpful for a book study like this and for our spiritual life is for you to... Uh, take notes in either the book or a handout, and then to look at them later. She asks some very good questions, and I will be asking you the same questions. These, by and large, are um, rhetorical, so you don't have to answer uh, out loud with everybody, but uh, know that they are they're there, and we will go through it. So, for the introduction of um, St. Benedict's Toolbox and a Rule of Benedict, which is a tool for Christian living, uh, we are reminded by the quote that we are with Christ to remain in his company in the times of consolation and joy, as well as times of trial in the way that he wills. And so for those of us that are on uh, Zoom right now, and for those that are on YouTube, um, some of us are in time of consolation, some are in joy, and some are in trial. And so this is um, it, it's a rule for uh, all facets in every stage of life. So with that, um, I'd like to read to you the first paragraph, which is right here, um, which I'm going to make just a little bit larger. Um, 
questions, and then scoot you all over here. Good. So, uh, Jane writes that we are ready to begin a journey that calls us into a deeper relationship with God, who continually reaches out to bring us an awareness of the divine presence in our lives. Yet, in the rush of daily life, with its many challenges, joys, and worries, we can lose sight of this presence. Too often, we fail to draw upon the rich resources that God offers us each hour of every day. Instead, we can feel alone, frustrated, or angry. We forget that we have been marked as Christ's own in our baptism. We turn aside from his grace and from the call to be his followers. And so this is where we begin, that we, have a, we can have uh, a deep relationship with God who's continually reaching out to us. Uh, but too often, we fail to draw upon those rich resources that are available every hour of every day. Uh, and instead, we feel alone, we feel frustrated, we can feel angry. And we forget that we are Christ's own forever. And so when she brought up baptism, uh, she then brings up our own baptismal covenant. So at the bottom of page one, uh, these are the questions that are read out loud to both the person being baptized and to the folks who are there to witness the baptism. And the first question that is asked is this, will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? And so right now, you all are participating in the teaching and the fellowship. Uh, we aren't breaking bread, but we are praying. And so, uh, yes, you are continuing in that, even though you may not feel that way. Um, and the second part is, will you persevere in resisting evil? And whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Yes. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? To each of these we answer, I will with God's help. And there are days when um, that I will is really hard to do, and there are days when we don't think God is helping us. But uh, again, following along with this, this class over the next seven weeks, uh, we will start to unlock those things in our own lives and finding what toolboxes we have. Um, so uh, she goes on in the, um, in the, let's see, first, second, in the, basically the, the second full paragraph of uh, page two, she begins, although we desire to follow Christ, and to live into our baptismal covenant. However, that covenant or statement of discipleship is expressed, much gets in the way of our good intentions. Life is often out of balance, as we're stretched one way and then another. We become distracted from what's really important to us, not finding enough time for family and friends, for ourselves and for God. And so if you're feeling that way, um, she's here to tell us about this and um, to walk with Benedict to get through that. Uh, she goes on further about, uh, and that is the next paragraph down, um, this distraction, she writes, this has spiritual consequences. We're not always able to look at life and see the good. Instead, we look at the world through glasses that see life as half empty. We focus on what isn't right, what is yet to be, or is still missing. We find ourselves, and even our children, and I would put in grandchildren, not living in the presence, and sorry, in the present, but living for the future. We can't stop long enough to reflect on why we're not satisfied. We long for a, a way to make sense of it all. We come to church seeking a connection with God and yet life is out of control. In a world where children, grandchildren, need pocket planners to keep track of their schedules, where life is more about success 
than about the riches of relationships and where a complex consumer society screams for our attention, we long for a way to break free. So, nothing like starting uh, on a nice light note, right? <laughs> so, uh, we'll then jump into, uh, first, do you all have any questions before we continue into the, uh, into the next section? All right, good. I see you're all still with me, so good. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into, we're going to start on page three, and uh, I'm going to bring that page up for you all to look at. Um, and this is where we have, uh, where it says, sitting at the feet of the Lord and the great commandment. Uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Uh, I did a bit of uh, biblical work this morning because you often have heard the truth will set you free. And uh, in John, the word to set is more accurate to uh, how we wrote it than to make. Uh, but there is an argument for both. Regardless, uh, what he's saying here is that if you continue my word, uh, if you continue doing what I've commanded you to do, you are my disciples, which is also translated as students, and you will know the truth, and this truth, or the truth, uh, will set you free. And so uh, she asks, how do we do this? And how do we um, accomplish this? So she tells a story from Luke, uh, which I hope that you're familiar with, and if not, um, you're about to be familiar with it. We're going to spend uh, the bulk of our time together talking about Mary and Martha. So uh, the story is here, and it's from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Uh, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. So Jane, our author, writes here, uh, Martha's problem wasn't that she was busy, but that she was distracted. And then she asked the first question, does this sound familiar? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it does to me, as she writes, it does to me, me, myself, personally, and from the nodding and looking at you all and hearing what you're saying, yes, uh, that this does sound, it's not about being busy. It's about being distracted. Uh, and so the Lord entreats us to listen and to listen like Mary. Uh, so hear what God is saying when, uh, to us requires us to make a choice, which she writes in italicies, we must choose to sit at the feet of the Lord. It's a choice. He's not going to make us do it. Uh, we can choose to sit and listen. And we don't have to spend all day there. We don't have to spend an entire week there. Uh, but we have, a choose to, uh, we have a choice to sit. And sit at the feet of the Lord and listen. Um, so then, this is the one who also said, and this is from Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. He's not making us do this, but he's saying if you ask, if you seek, if you knock, the door will be opened. And so the question that I have, that I hope that you all have too, is uh, on page four, 
the, uh, the first full paragraph that begins, how? Uh, our author asks this question, how do we sit at the feet of the Lord so that we may fulfill the promises that we make in our baptismal covenant and live Jesus' commandment to love God and to love our neighbor as ourself? How do we sit at the feet of the Lord? Um, so that is the, uh, the question that we are going to continue. Um, so. Picture it there. Oh, here we go. All right. If you want to go to page five, um, we're going to talk about um, Benedict himself. Um, so a real quick disclaimer before we, before we jump into this. Uh, quick disclaimer. The university I went to for undergraduate study is a uh, Benedictine university. So uh, we have uh, monks who are a part of the Order of St. Benedict, uh, which the acronym is OSB. And so if you ever see an author who has the title OSB, you know that they're in the Order of St. Benedict. Uh, I happen to have great regard for this, uh, this man and for his system. Uh, and so just know I'm not entering this as an unbiased or disinterested party. I, I certainly think he has the right way of doing it. Um, and the other thing is because I'm, I'm proud of my university. For those that watch the PBS Evening News, they did a quick little study on uh, what universities are doing. And my little university in the capital town of Washington State actually got mentioned on TV. Um, and it's because the Benedictine tradition has a way of teaching students in smaller batches or smaller groups, which happens to work really, really well in a pandemic. Uh, and the monks had spent since uh, March, they have spent time uh, in their own enclave learning how to live with a pandemic on the outside world and how to stay safe on the inside world. If you are a part of the order and you're living at uh, St. Martin's Abbey in Lacey, Washington, uh, if you live there, you have to get up at six in the morning to pray. You pray at nine, you pray at noon, you pray at three, you pray at six, you pray at nine o'clock at night. And you do it communally. Uh, you work together. Everything is about being together. And so they had to learn how to manage the virus and be together. And so that then, um, when the school opened in the fall, that rolled out to the students so that they're able to continue teaching to have a good collegiate experience, uh, but also stay safe at the same time. It does help that they have 641 acres uh, just north of Olympia, Washington, where they can really isolate themselves. But uh, anyway, so enough about Benedict uh, for me personally. Uh, let's see what our author has to say uh, about him. And that is, starting on page five, um, in the middle of the, the first full paragraph, uh, she talks about Joan Chittister, who is also a part of the Order of St. Benedict, uh, that Joan wrote, the rule is designed, quote, for ordinary people who live ordinary lives. It was written to provide a model of spiritual development for the average person who intends to live life beyond the superficial or the uncaring. Okay, so this is uh, a rule for ordinary people, ordinary lives, uh, who want spiritual development to live beyond superficial or the uncaring life. Um, back when Benedict was uh, on the earth, there was uh, the same type of um, uh, consumer culture. I know it seems strange, but for their day and time, it was a consumer culture, and it was screaming for their attention, um, as were politics, as both local, uh, national, and then, of course, with the empire. Uh, that there were uh, changes and upheavals in education. I mean, the, the whole thing, the church was actually starting to go through a reformation. It's, uh, it's amazing. And so he was finding a simple and ordinary life uh, with God. And so um, it is a rule or a canon. And as she writes in this uh, next paragraph, uh, the Greek word for canon actually originally meant a trellis. And so a trellis is, you know, what you would grow uh, tomatoes or other plants, they would follow a trellis. And without having a trellis in place, uh, the, the plants you're trying to grow would be disorganized on the ground and kind of grow on top of each other. And so this trellis or this rule is a way of support so that life can grow up in through it and around it and provide for 
uh, for those that are guessing what I'm going to say next, provide for good fruit. So, um, so that's it. Uh, then the, uh, the next paragraph um, that with this trellis is that we are going to uh, frame into this so that, as Paul said, we can live into the same mind uh, that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, so Jesus took time for himself. Jesus took time for prayer. Jesus took time for his own, I know it sounds strange, spiritual development. And so um, that mind that was in Christ, uh, we are going to attempt to do as well. So... Um, the goals of the book are at the top of page six, and these seem uh, awfully lofty goals, uh, just, just so you know. Uh, but this is what we're going to attempt to do. And that is, again, at the top of page six, is to know that God is intimately involved in your daily life. Uh, that is a fantastic goal all by itself. Number two is to listen for God in all aspects of your life from scripture to daily occurrences and relationships, to apply Benedict's teaching on the rule to make the often chaotic and fragmented 21st century life less chaotic and less fragmented. And she writes editorially, yes, it can be done. Uh, to discover ways to maintain healthy relationships with others and health, uh, healthy and balanced view of yourself, and to use the tools in the toolbox to reflect on your life and to practice ideas from the rule. Now, this, this seems overwhelming, uh, at least it does for me. Uh, so we are going to uh, break it down more simply by introducing the toolbox. Um, this morning, I was going to bring in my toolbox. I mean, I have a literal, as you would imagine, uh, a box with tools in it, and I was gonna pull out all the different tools to show you. But imagine in your mind uh, the toolbox and all the various things that we already have within us in order to accomplish these goals of connecting with God and connecting in with one another. So, um, she writes under the toolbox, the first paragraph, our Benedictine journey has three key goals. Living into our baptismal covenant, which is really hard to do, just want to point out editorially. Living into our baptismal covenant, following Jesus' great commandment, really hard to do, and number three, meeting the challenge of living as a Christian in today's world. Uh, yeah, this is what we're going to attempt to do. But we're going to do it slowly and methodically uh, with our tools. So um, she gives us three, and we're going to cover only one tool today. Uh, the first one is um, talking about the, uh, the baptismal covenant. And she asks some questions, and these questions are on page seven. Um, and with the uh, baptismal covenant, which of the actions are hardest for you to do? Which of them challenge you? Are there any areas you wish to know more about? Um, so this is something that you can share with me later on. Um, you can take notes on it and, uh, and work on it that way. But I just want you to know that it's there. Number two is a review of relationships. And somebody is on the phone. Let me see who that is. Is that Lynn? Anyway, I think we're good. Um, so the second one is review of my relationships. This is a fantastic um, tool, but it's something that you would get to do individually. And so whether you have the handout or if you have the book yourself, um, uh, and, you know, read through it and answer it as you will. Um, so that is on page eight. And then uh, page nine is where we will be spoke, uh, focusing uh, our attention for, uh, today for today's class. So let me turn to page nine here. Um, so this is um, for us to ponder, and I'm going to invite... Uh, those that are on, um, on our Zoom call, that this might be a time for you to talk. So we're going to read through these. Um, so Mary and Martha, the purpose of this tool is to give an opportunity to assess whether you are more like Mary or more like Martha in your daily life. Now, some of you may have already made this decision, and that's fine, but we're going to walk a little closer through it. Um, so this is to assess 
uh, one of the tools we're going to use is, are you more like Mary or more like Martha? To give you a recap, uh, Martha is the one who is too busy to listen to what Jesus was having to say at her house. Again, Jesus came to her home and was talking to his disciples. And if you can imagine what that would be like today, if Jesus were to appear and then to have Peter and James and John and the rest of them together, uh, and that you would be too busy to hear. Um, what I believe is that Jesus is speaking today uh, and that some believe the saints are also talking at the same time, that they are as close as your living room, um, but that we are too busy to listen. And so um, Mary is the one who uh, rejected helping her sister and sat down at Jesus' feet and listened. So the tool is here. Uh, and she said, answer the following questions. Do you spend the greater part of your day doing things for others or for yourself? So that's a good question. Um, all right, so I'm going to... There we go, all right. So I think Larry was talking. So I wanted to make sure he wasn't talking to us. So back to our image here. Do you spend the greater part of your day doing things for others or for yourself? This is a hard question. Um, so I want you to ponder that. Um, the second question is, uh, I'm going to make these a little bit bigger, I think. There we go. Okay. Do you take time for yourself each day? How much time? Are you able to sit down and read or talk with a friend? How much time do you take each day for prayer, for reading scripture, or meditation? For uh, Benedict, this would be grouped in largely together. Um, if you're reading scripture, you are meditating and you're praying. If you are praying, you are undoubtedly praying along the lines of some scripture that you had heard once in your life. If you're meditating, you most likely are practicing in one of these things. So that's why it's all kind of wrapped in together. So the question is, how much time do you take each day for it? And, um, and don't be embarrassed. God already knows. Uh, and God loves you. So... You don't have to worry about that. Um, but that's a good question for you to answer. Um, the next one, are you comfortable with the amount of time that you have for yourself? And she didn't say that you take for yourself, but that you have for yourself. Are you always on the move from morning until night? Does your schedule leave you exhausted? Um, yes. Uh, and if you could, how would you change the way you spend most days? Um, if you could, how would you change the way you spend most days? That's, and I mean, we could spend an hour on each, probably each one of these questions. And so she asks that. So I'm going to have you hold on to that for a bit. And now we're going to look at uh, page 10, which is our final page for today. And that is, um, in the, uh, the beginning of the first full paragraph, uh, this, let's see, second, third sentence down. Uh, we may find that we're more comfortable in one role, and one of the roles would be either Mary or Martha. We might be more comfortable in one role than in the other. And so you might feel more comfortable being busy and uh, doing all the work of the day, you f might find yourself more comfortable being the one who can sit and listen and take time for yourself. Um, so we're more comfortable, and we're not always going to be one thing or another. We're going to be a blend of both. So whichever is our comfortable role, she writes, we need to take some time to develop its opposite. So we need to take time to develop its opposite. If you are more like Martha, with an outward focus. Pay close attention to what Benedict and the toolboxes suggest 
regarding prayer, time alone, and balance in your life. Okay? So if you self-identify as Martha, the tool, one of the tools in your toolbox is to pay close attention to regarding prayer time, time alone, and balance in your life. If you are more like Mary, however, and you're more comfortable with an inward focus, pay close attention to what Benedict and the toolboxes suggest regarding community, regarding relationships, and regarding service to others. So, if you're more like Mary and you take time for yourself, you sit at the Lord's feet and you listen, um, you are being challenged by the rule of Benedict um, to instead pay close attention to regarding community, to regarding relationships, and regarding service to others. And so then, um, she goes on, if you find yourself most often in the action mode with hardly time to catch your breath, then the sections of the book that encourage reflection and quiet will nurture your inward self. If you find yourself most comfortable being alone, spending a considerable time um, alone and or taking time to nurture your spiritual life, then pay attention to the teachings that have us reaching out to others. The beauty is that the rule of Benedict provides us with a balanced approach to life that tends to, need, uh, tends to the needs of both the inward and the outward person. So, with that, uh, I'm going to turn off the screen share. And if you all wanted to look at uh, or have me bring up a particular section, I would be happy to do that. So, um, so with that, I'm going to ask some, some basic questions. Again, you don't have to answer, but, uh, but I would like to hear uh, what you all think. So, um, and I muted uh, the Ashleys, so I now have unmuted you. Um, Thanks. So, hi. Good to hear you, Gail. Oh, but I still can hear Larry, so I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to mute him. I don't know if he wants his conversation going out across everywhere else. So, and I see Ed and Jenny. Hello, good to see you, Jenny. Uh, and you guys are muted too. So, um, how familiar are you with uh, Saint Benedict and with his rule? Is this uh, all new stuff to you? Is this something that you are familiar with? Uh, are you somewhere in between? What do you think? Somewhere in between. Hmm. Good. Good, good, good. Um, that helps. And Mary, are you familiar with, um, uh, with him? Somewhat. Oh, uh, you're, so you're muted. <laughs> Mary, you're Is muted. You Is that what you asked? Yeah. All right, just a second. So, Mary, uh, if you can unmute yourself. No, it's Gloria. Okay. Hi, Gloria. Yes, excellent. All right. Now, Mary Ortiz is back on. Hello. You were saying something? Well, I wasn't really familiar with Benedict because I was brought up Presbyterian, and then I became, as a young adult, an Episcopalian. And I, I, my contact with the saints wasn't in depth, but the ones that I knew were basically Bene Benedict and St. Francis. And um, I kind of learned that Benedict was rather austere, and St. Francis, you know, partied with the animals. And it's, you know, he was seemed more user friendly, but I read all of this yesterday and, and more, and I'm just totally engaged. I'm loving it. It's just it's opening up a whole new concept to me. Good, good, excellent. And um, it's really food for thought. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, I was not familiar with uh, orders. Uh, you know, being an Episcopalian, we have them, but they're not that pronounced. Um, and so going to uh, a Roman Catholic university with the Benedictines and spending four years with them uh, was a really, really good education. 
And so then um, I was working for a company that moved me to Los Angeles. And I made some friends that were uh, in their final years at Loyola Marymount, uh, which also has its own order. And so I walked in and I saw one of uh, their monks and I was really happy and, you know, I feel very comfortable talking to, uh, to men of the order. And so I walked up to him and introduced myself. And he, uh, he started chatting and he, he did something with his glasses and he was wearing a Rolex. And so the Order of St. Benedict uh, is with your, within the order. Uh, you are to own nothing. Um, that everything that you have is actually owned by the order. And so in uh, college, my favorite professor uh, was Father Killian, Order of St. Benedict, and uh, <laughs> Killian loved to run. That was one of the things that Benedict had taught him, is that spending time by himself was to be out jogging in amongst the 600-some acres that the university has. And uh, his family, every six months, would mail him a set of new running shoes. And he would take the running shoes, he would take them to the abbot, uh, who was in charge of the monastery. And he would say, abbot, I have these shoes that I would like to give to the order. And the abbot would look around and say, these shoes only fit you, Father Killian. And he would say, yes. Well, then you should be the one to wear them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he would do that because he owns nothing. And so that I, I went onto the campus of Loyola Marymount and I, I met a, a man in an order who was wearing a Rolex. It was, <laughs> are you kidding me? You can own that? And so I asked, you can actually own a Rolex? And he said, yeah, yeah, we can. I'm like, he said it was a gift. He didn't buy it. I'm like, I, okay, I get it. So I quickly learned there are many different ways uh, and many different orders. So, um, and that's where many of you that were raised um, in the Roman Catholic tradition, you already knew this, and, and, and I didn't. So um, the, the rule of Benedict, we are not going to be following this pattern of getting rid of all of your worldly goods. We're not going to be doing that. That's not uh, the rule of this book. Um, it is to, uh, to refocus one and uh, to oneself. So, and Larry, I see you're back. Hello. Is the hurricane still there? <laughs> Just, just an, an, an anecdote. Uh, Thursday, we get a video call, Wednesday. Or, or Wednesday, I should say, a video call periodically from a 97-year-old longtime friend who's in a home in Kingston, Ontario, near north of Syracuse, and uh, he calls religiously. It's his only contact outside, and... Um, it's a joy to see him, and his eyes just sparkle when he, this new technology permits us face-to-face. Uh, -face. So there's joy in our hearts right at the moment. Oh, that's wonderful. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that, Larry. Wonderful. Good. So um, with this rule of Benedict, uh, we went down some questions that were asked, uh, um, you know, that our, our author asked. And... Uh, the first one is, do you spend the greater part of your day doing things for others or for yourself? And then the second question is, do you take time for yourself each day? How much time? Are you ever able to sit down and read or talk with a friend? And then uh, the one that, uh, that I raised my hand to is the second to last question. Are you always on the move from morning until night? And does your schedule... Uh, leave you exhausted. So um, I answered that for myself, especially the last one, by saying, yeah, uh, my schedule uh, leaves me pretty, pretty darn tired. Uh, part of it is that I have a Martha complex. And so if I were to lay down at night and not be exhausted, I would think to myself, hmm, I didn't work hard enough today. <laughs> um, and that's that's not good, um, but it's there. And it's also what life is like um, having uh, two children and living in a pandemic and uh, not having uh, clear-cut rules anymore on what it is to be a parent, what it is to be a rector, um, how to visit people who are ill, uh, how to do communion, how to do laying on of hands and prayers, um, everything has, uh, has come upside down. And so, um, uh, so I'm wondering how you all are feeling. 
And where are you with the greater part of your day doing things for others or for yourself and taking time for yourself? Um, and do you feel exhausted with your schedule at the end of the day? Well, I, I could say something about this COVID environment. Um, for the first several months, I felt um, a freedom that I hadn't felt in a very long time. I seemed to have more time available uh, for other things. Um, perhaps some of those were selfish things, but for other things generally. Um, but then something has set in and that freedom is now being crowded out with a freneticism again because I found ways to clutter up my f previously freedom rich days. I, I don't know whether this is a human psychosis or what it, what it is, but it comes back to how does one parse their time? How does one, you, you make reference to, to doing certain things during a finite period of time, let's say a day. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I can do something like this call we've just had, it was seven minutes long. It had the impact of 12 hours. It's been <laughs> joyful. Um, so, so the day doesn't break down into neat little hourly packages. And, and so I guess the bottom line for me is um, what one does with their time, with their thoughts, with their, uh, their role of God, the role of God of their life, their, their service to their neighbors and friends, their wife, their children, it doesn't break down into neat little things. There's no symmetry about it. There's, and, and so I, I, find, I find that my days um, are, are comfortably full. And I don't ever expect they will not be comfortably full to the day I'm taking my last breaths, which I don't know if others feel this way or not, but that's kind of how I am. Wonderful. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. So, Allison, you look like you have something on your mind. Well, I would say I feel I don't do enough. Uh, for other people. There's always, you know, more that could be done. Um, I get distracted by probably stupid tasks at home, um, uh, easily distracted, I think, and uh, feel a need to uh, concentrate more. Uh, I think I would get more done if I was more disciplined. I think perhaps it's a lack of discipline. Mm -hmm. that I get distracted. Um, sometimes I blame it on Tom, of course. Um, but uh, uh, I try and do things uh, for neighbors. Uh, if they need to be taken to a doctor for a, um, a shot in their back, or I have a neighbor who's pretty infirm now, and, uh, and she calls me, and I'm happy to do that. Um, and... Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, I do feel I feel I could do more, certainly, yeah. for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's keep working on this, and we'll see. We'll see what that is. So, um, for me, one thing you do for us is that you lead the prayers at eight o'clock on Sunday morning, and uh, <laughs> so thank you. You do. That is wonderful. And um, from, from a pastoral perspective, uh, with all the rules changing and not having clear direction on what to do, uh, having um, you and having Ginger and, uh, and my family and uh, Reverend Maggie uh, and Dale to count on, knowing that it could be, you know, 50 mile an hour winds and y'all are going to be here. You know, <laughs> that it's, it's a wonderful thing. So, uh, so thank you. But we'll continue... Uh, stretching and working on on ways to uh, to do meaningful, uh, impactful things for our neighbors to um, to follow the rule. 
So, Ed, you're muted. And uh, I saw Jenny there, and now she's, now she's gone. She's preparing to do things for others. She has a Friends of the Library Zoom conference in about half an hour, and she's finishing up her, her notes. So. 30 plus people. 30 plus people. Wow. <laughs> And she's and she's she's directing this, so yes, that's why she keeps <coughs> drifting in and out of uh, out of frame here. All right, excellent. Can I ask you a direct question? Um, uh, are you comfortable with the amount of time you take for uh, prayer and reading and all that for yourself? Well, I don't do much reading. Um, for several reasons. One is it's, it's difficult to read. Um, as far as prayer, well, I, I pray in the morning, my, my, my early, you know, the snooze alarm prayer. Um, yes. <laughs> you and I should write a book about the snooze alarm prayer. <laughs> yes. Yeah, raise your hand if you have a snooze alarm prayer. <laughs> that, that is wonderful. Um, Take notes here. It's wonderful. Yes. Good. It is, it is a legitimate thing. Um, yeah, and it's a good way to start your day. I mean, you know, you start out counting your blessing. That's, a, I think, a, a proper way to start the day. Yes. I do, too. Yep, yep. Um, I'm also a fan of the drift off to fall asleep while praying. Uh, and That's mine. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> good. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm thankful for the blessings I've had all the day and pray for those that need them. Yeah. And I, I never get through my list, right? <laughs> I'm usually asleep by that point. So uh, I had a professor, because we were talking about this in seminary, and, uh, and I'd shared about that. Um, and that my prayer life largely is bookended with the snooze alarm and then the hitting the pillow and falling asleep. And, uh, and she told me, you know, she has uh, children. And she said that when her kids were younger, um, she would love to wake them up and to hear what it was that was first on their mind when the kids woke up. And it's uh, usually having to do with food or something. But you would wake them up and say, it's Charlie, it's time to get up. And then Charlie would say something. And she said, that must be what our prayers sound like to God when we wake up in the morning. It's like we're up <laughs> and we tell God immediately what's on our mind, which usually has to do with food or schedules or, you know, something, pain. Um, and then she would say when she tucks her kids, she would love it when the kids were talking and they would fall asleep mid-sentence. And that as a parent, her heart just felt like it just grew when that happened. And that perhaps when we fall asleep in prayer, God's heart just grows because it's the last thing that we're saying and it's incoherent and <laughs> incomplete, but it's beautiful. Um, so anyway... Um, Ed, you and I are going to work on a project called the Snooze Alarm Prayer. <laughs> that is wonderful. <laughs> uh, speaking of such things, if you're wondering, I have coffee and ice water. And um, a friend of mine, Linda, is on with us right now uh, in Chula Vista. She taught me a very good, rich Mexican tradition, which is to have a cup of black coffee and to accompany it with a glass of ice water. And did you just hold one up? Do you have that too right now, Linda? No, I have my water. You have your water. <laughs> all right. Well. My coffee is here, but I think I've drunk it all. <laughs> nice. Um, I'm going to show you something. Uh, I brought one of these, just in case oh. I need <laughs> so, um, That's you. Yeah, it is. And if Jan Webb is watching the director of our altar guild, she's probably like, what are you doing with coffee? Anyway, but I think I'm, I think I'm safe. I think we're okay. He drinks coffee. <laughs> yes. Good. All right, so with all of that, I'm gonna check our time to see, oh, we're, we're wrapping up near the end of this. Oh. All right, yes, Linda. Who? Oh, did you, were you gonna say something? It's just that I always have been a Mary and I was never enough of a Martha. And now I am alone all the time, perfect time to spend my merry life doing exactly what I please, but I find myself a Martha as I've never been before. I am continually preoccupied with either cooking for myself, cleaning up after myself, 
trying to straighten out my house, taking on a daily project to get my, my possessions more organized than they are. Uh, and it's, it, it is quite amazing how the day can, and then the only thing I do for other people is to listen to my sisters when they call on the phone, which in the case of one is quite frequent during the day. It's amazing how much time she, well, she actually mostly texts in, but that's even worse because you hear this little irritating bell and you know who it is. <laughs> but anyway, it's just, uh, I have less time than ever before. So less you, time. And, yeah, crazy. Yeah. And poor Martha, she's working all the time. She She's is. always busy. Yeah, yeah. So you were caring for your husband um, before he passed, and you have uh, your, well, I mean, I know Benjamin, your son, so I know that you've been busy, and you were a teacher, but you're, you're busier now doing Martha stuff? Yes, yeah. I am. Well, in those days, the Mary and the Martha were blended. My desire, my joy, my service, and my reward were all in working with them. Right. Now it's just me. What am I going to do? Work or think? <laughs> it's hard to get the two together. Although I'm writing a book now, so I'm supposed to be spending the first two hours of every day working on that. And that gives me some enforced time. Good, good. Great. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. All right, well, um, do you like the format that we're doing with the book and, uh, and where we're headed with this? Is this working for you all? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Thank you. All right. So far, so good. So far, so good. Nice. It's, well, it's a big book, and we only have seven weeks together. So um, next week, we're going to be covering uh, chapter two, uh, and this is a prayer form that I greatly struggle with. All right, and it's called Lectio Divina, and it's listening, listening to God in Scripture. And you might say, but how can that be a struggle? Um, that Lectio Divina is a very particular, slow way of um, reading through Scripture. And um, uh, I had a very powerful experience with it once uh, with a group of clergy. And so um, Lectio Divina is where you, you read there are many different forms of it, but the one that our particular clergy group was doing uh, was we have a particular passage, and somebody reads it, and then we take uh, two minutes of silence, and then somebody reads it again, two minutes of mm -hmm. silence. And each time we do that, you remember a verb, or you hold on to a phrase or a passage, and then you share with the group uh, what that word was. And um, by the third time through, we all had focused on the word wind, that uh, the eight of us in my office had, um, had the word wind yeah. holding in our head. And at that moment, a wind ripped through my office and blew uh, things off of my desk and everything else. And oh, it, yeah. <laughs> and, and we all kind of looked around like, did you just experience? Now, I had a window open. This is Southern California. You always have a window open. But it was. Anyway, it was very powerful. So um, there is a lot to it. And if you are a Martha, uh, like me, um, you may not like this model at all, but I'm going to invite you to try it. And, it, and if you're a Mary, um, you're going to teach us, and you're going to help us uh, walk through this to give us the patience to make it through. So uh, next week, we're going to be doing that. Wait for my email to come out. Um, I will have very specific things of which tool we are going to focus on together. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I look forward to that. And for those that are on YouTube and watching us recorded and later, uh, feel free to email me. And if you have any questions, if you have anything you wanted to raise, then, um, then I will do that next week as well. So um, I appreciate all of you coming out and for uh, taking time for yourself and for others. Because when we study uh, a way of deepening our relationship with God, we are deepening our relationship with others as well. And so we have already begun on this journey uh, of self-reflection and of meditation and of living into 
um, God's command of loving him and loving our neighbor. So uh, may God bless you and watch over you and surround you. May God be with uh, our nation. May God be with Canada. May God be with all of our leaders and those who are striving as first responders and those who are protecting us around the globe and those who are helping uh, clean and those who are providing food and are laboring for our everyday lives. May God bless you. May God bless them and watch over us and protect us. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, David. Thank you. Hi, Mary.